The following is a Metro TV special presentation. Um, I am Dr. Mark Jorish. I am a physician here in Louisville, been here for quite a while, um, and have been with the Moore Center, Methadone Opiate Rehabilitation Education Center, for longer than I probably want to admit, but I will tell you it's since 1993. For those of you who know Robert Thompson there, I think uh, he preceded me by a month or two. I've done a number of things here in Louisville, um, and, but basically my practice now is addiction medicine. My training is in internal medicine, not in psychiatry, um, but I did, did get attracted to the addiction medicine field and uh, work at two clinics. Let's see if we can go there. Medical Director Moore Center, Medical Director BHG is a private clinic in Lexington. I also need to disclose that I work as a consultant to Indivior, which is the company that makes the product that you, probably, that you may know as Suboxone. So what I'd like to do here is, well, let's review a little history, get a little science into it, talk about methadone and medication-assisted treatment in general and some stigma that surrounds it, and then talk about uh, how it's done here in Kentucky. Bottom line, if treatment is done well, the benefits far outweigh the potential consequences. So with any kind of medical process procedure, there are potential downsides, but we need to measure the benefits and, and make sure that what we do pays more in dividends. Historically, I'll predate this slide a little bit and, and say, you know, opiates have been around for a long time. Um, I always like to think about, oh, the late 1800s and going back to the old westerns I watched as a kid and people going to the doctor and talking about laudanum. I need, I need my laudanum. And laudanum is opium. And it was around and prescribed all the time, and I think it made people feel better. Um, however, it did create its uh, series of problems, and then you come to 1914 and in around Prohibition days, and um, it was felt that it was causing too much of a problem, so the Narcotic Addiction Treatment Act was written that really put a lot of restrictions on the use of opiates. A lot of time passed, um, and then we get up to the 1950s and 60s with we want to call it a heroin epidemic now, a heroin epidemic back then, there was just too much problem and so needed to create some room for the use of, or room for treatment of opiate, what we call opiate use disorders now. And uh, original studies um, actually were done west of the Mississippi in a penitentiary in Texas and east of the Mississippi in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, those were problematic studies. Uh, we sometimes hear what happens to prisoners now and mistreatment. Well, there was some real experimentation. And put it, I think that was actually the beginning of stigma surrounding methadone because it was one of the products that was used. But then some real good scientific information was developed. Dr. Vincent Dole, in a collaboration with Marie Niswander at Rockefeller University, looked at methadone as a treatment for opiate use problems and really found that it was quite helpful. People got better. Um, and methadone was eventually selected as the most efficacious opiate. We then come around to federal regulations were developed. Uh, methadone still had its limitations, but it could be used within the clinic setting. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. In the year 2000, the Drug Addiction Treatment Act was written, and was really written because a new product was around called buprenorphine, which sh showed some real benefits in the treatment of uh, opiate use disorder. And so this law, this legislation, created a process where Schedule 3, 4, and 5 medications could be used for treatment of opiate disorders um, in an office-based setting. We're now outside the clinic much less regulation attached to it. And um, buprenorphine, and at that point it was only Suboxone, Suboxone and Subutex, um, were the only products available for that. 
And, and still, it's really only buprenorphine products that can be used in this office-based setting for treatment of opiate use disorders. Um, so we all read the newspaper. You've probably, probably been bombarded over the last three, four, five years with a lot of these stats. Just to, just to run through it, people are dying every day. We, the doctors, write a lot of prescriptions for opioid medications. Um, as a matter of fact, hydrocodone, which you might know as Lortab and Vicodin, the U.S. writes 90% of prescriptions, 90% internationally, of all the prescriptions for hydrocodone. We're really good about that or bad about that here in the United States. Um, heroin users, and we've seen that movement to heroin use most recently, um, all started with using prescription opioid medications. We're getting better uh, in terms of being able to pay for treatment. Medicaid is coming around, but it's very costly. And you know, we know there are limitations as to what the Medicaid program can afford. Heroin has come around now, uh, probably as a result, or, uh, at least in part, if not uh, um, substantially, from the laws that were written here in 2012 and in many other states surrounding prescribing of opioid medications. Uh, they, new information came around um, saying that, you know, the chronic use of opioids for pain problems is not the best way to treat chronic pain problems. And uh, doctors needed to learn that. Um, there, were, there was a lot of misuse and misprescription. Laws were written, and so doctors have really not stopped, but have really lessened the amount of prescribing that they're doing. So the pills are not available. The Percocets and the Lortabs, they're just not out on the street. Heroin became much more available. It actually was cheaper, and many of my patients now present having used heroin, and unfortunately, injection heroin use with the concomitant problems. Um, and there are a lot of patients with addiction disorders out there. Um, probably about 1.3 million in treatment and close to 6, 7 million that are not in treatment. This is the brain sort of section if you cut straight, straight across from front to back. I know this says cocaine, but you could probably substitute uh, any drug that you want for what I will describe. It's a PET scan, and a PET scan measures glucose, sugar metabolism within the brain. Now, if you look on your left, the normal brain, the brain's working, the cells are working, it's taking up glucose, sugar to, to operate. The middle picture shows somebody who has been using cocaine for an extended period of time, just stopped, and you see the difference in that brain. That's the bad news. But perhaps there's some good news. A hundred days down the line, three months down the line, you see some increased glucose metabolism, some increased operation in that brain. It does heal. So we need to be talking about opiate use disorder as a brain disease. These drugs, and, and, I'll, and as I say, opiates and cocaine and any of them, are affecting, damaging the brain. Um, people aren't thinking very clearly when they're in the midst of their addiction, and uh, we just do hope that it gets better over time. So let's talk a little bit about opioids. I'm using that word a whole lot. What is an opioid? And specifically, an opioid is any substance that works on an opiate, opioid receptor in the brain. Next slide will tell a little bit more about that. There are the natural opioids, which for your purposes, basically you're morphine and codeine. But then we've developed, you know, pharmaceutically, lots of other synthetic and semi-synthetic semi synthetic opiates. They're very good substances. It's not that they shouldn't be used for pain. They're great analgesic preparations. You couldn't get a better cough suppressant than, you know, you can take your Robitussin over the counter. It may or may not do very much for you, but you take an opiate for cough suppression, it works quite well. And also, it is used in the treatment of opiate dependence. But they can be misused, so there needs to be some guidance and, and oversight. Opioid receptors. 
we think of, and this is, might get a little complex, so raise your hand or do something if I'm, if I'm getting out of it. It's just getting a, a bit uh, anatomical here and physiologic. Three major receptors in the brain, the mu, the kappa, and the deltas, delta receptors. For our purposes, in opiate use disorders, we're talking about that mu receptor in the brain um, that these medications attach to. And the medications that are most useful bind to that receptor, activate that mu receptor. And here, you know, heroin, methadone, hydromorphone, dilaudid, buprenorphine, codeine, fentanyl, and on and on. Those are the products that uh, perhaps you have seen and heard as mu opioid receptor activators. This is the brain. This is a slice the other way, down this way. And what you're looking at there in purple is what we call the reward center. VTA is the ventral tegmental area, the nucleus accumbens, and the prefrontal cortex. Every drug of abuse activates this reward center. That's what feels good. When you use a drug, it activates the reward center. And in other addictions, probably it is activation of that reward center that gives the feel good. This then is that same brain. You see the VTA and the nucleus accumbens and all those little blue spots are the receptors within the brain. You see the receptors in the prefrontal cortex there. You see them in the reward center, but you also see it in other brain structures. So if these opioid drugs are binding to receptors and damaging the whole process, it's not just the reward process that gets affected. It's in the hippocampus that has to do with memory. It's in the amygdala that has to do with emotional distress and on and on. So it is a full total brain disease. This now takes it down to a very chemical level. Um, you can see here that this is an opiate. Somebody has used an opiate that binds to a neuron. Here is a neuron second neuron, a third neuron. This space in between is called the synapse. The opiate receptor, uh, opiate binds to the opiate receptor and stimulates that receptor to cause an impulse that then feeds into this neuron in the reward center, which then releases dopamine. That is the active neurohormone, again, in, in, in all substances of abuse. It is the dopamine. Cocaine stimulates right here to release the dopamine. Opiates, alcohol, benzodiazepines, Valium, Xanax, Clonopin, all act through other, uh, other neurons and, and becomes a bit more complex cascade. So the dopamine gets released and stimulates and, and then binds to a dopamine receptor. And then, again, then you have emanations to the prefrontal cortex and to all these other areas in the brain to cause whatever symptoms and signs we see in opiate addiction. So here is that synapse, the dopamine, stimulating the dopamine receptor, and this is inside the cell. So the use of this drug of this drug causes changes, effects within the middle of this drug. And it's been carried out too. And this is where we're getting, we get a little hazy as to the exact effects. But just for, your, for an example for you, it causes DNA or chromosomal effects and changes within this cell. So operations are different. Summary, brain disease, brain damaged. Hopefully when you stop using that, the brain repairs. Be okay? So I've talked about the mu receptor, talked about a number of products that stimulate that mu receptor. When I talk about heroin, methadone, hydrocodone, uh, oxycodone, we're talking about a full agonist. Agonist, something that stimulates. So when you, well, uh, here we go. When you increase the dose, you see you get an opioid effect, which also could be sedation, sleepy, tired, respiratory depression. The more you give, the more effect you get. A little bit of danger in all of that, but it does give you that effect. When we use a substance like buprenorphine, same thing. It's actually called a partial agonist, so you give it, it gives a nice effect, but it's limited to this ceiling effect. 
Uh, so it does do give some benefit to the patient. Perhaps it's safer because you don't get very close to this toxic lethal dose up here. Really the big difference between, you know, why don't we use heroin for maintenance therapy, although that, that's another story. Methadone is a very long-acting medication, so it gets in slowly. Not like heroin, which gets in and out and in and out. So it's a very different kind of medication and therefore much more therapeutic in, in the, this disease process. And then you get to this, which we're calling an antagonist, an opioid antagonist. Also binds to that mu receptor. But it doesn't do anything. So now you've heard, and there's a, a lot of play recently about Vivitrol, or naltrexone. That is the example of this antagonist. It binds the receptor, it occupies that receptor, but has no effect. Hopefully it decreases craving and, and some of the opioid, uh, you know, uh, uh, avoids some of the opioid effects, um, but it doesn't give this little stimulus that you'd get from the agonist medications. All right, so just to discuss that surrounding stigma, what people say which really may not be true and how it may develop into stigma and looking down on this medication and, and this treatment or these medications and this treatment. A medication is not a part of treatment. Well, we know that that's not true. We have all sorts of diseases and if we can uh, um, attach the moniker disease, brain disease to addiction, we know that there ought to be medications that are capable of treating that disease. Um, but those, the use of and the decisions need to be in hands of people who, under, clinicians who understand and recognize and can treat. It's not just as simple as writing a prescription and, and delivering that medication. We also talk about drugs a lot. Probably some people are on their high blood pressure medications and they're talking about their drug that they take. Well, I don't like that terminology, particularly when talking about methadone and buprenorphine. A medication versus a drug. Um, yes, methadone is a great medication. We also see people use it as a drug. We see people use hydrocodone as a medication because they had a tooth pulled, but we also see them misuse it as a drug. We also need to consider physical dependence for versus addiction. Physical dependence. Any of us who for a long enough time, and that would really happen within a matter of weeks, used an opiate regularly, chronically, would develop physical dependence, which means you stop, you, you're, when you're using it, you're developing tolerance, and when you stop using it, you're going to go into withdrawal. Addiction, on the other hand, look more at the behaviors that are associated with the misuse of that drug or medication. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, people, my patients will go to AA and NA. They don't want to talk to me. I'm on methadone. I'm on buprenorphine, suboxone. Well, AA, when it was developed, um, Bill W. and Dr. Bob never talked about pros or cons use of medication. I mean, you'll see some 12-step folks saying, I can't take an aspirin, Tylenol, or whatever. They're just so, well, you know, that, that's their choice. But there never was anything to say that medications couldn't be used. Back in this day, and, and even in my time in the, you know, in the 90s, we didn't have all of the science surrounding a, a knowledge base understanding this disease process as well as we do now. It's really impressive to me that so many of the things that we saw, the behaviors, actually now we can relate to a very strict scientific biologic process. We just have a much better understanding. Our observations were really right on. And then MAT, medication-assisted treatment, is, is not effective. Well, you know, it did pass FDA approval, so obviously somebody studied it. And if you look from those 1950 studies all the way on, it's probably one of the most studied medications because of the concerns of methadone. And the scientific evidence supporting its benefits is incontrovertible. Um, so uh, again, another story to to give to patients uh, or critics of the use of the medication. And I, I 
put this in here um, because, and, and there'll be another slide quickly shown, consider an inmate addicted and we've been taught, you know, we talk with Metro Corrections a lot and so many, a great, a majority uh, of those that are arrested have uh, substance use disorders. Um, they're incarcerated a month, three months, three years, they're released. But for a variety of reasons, they get back to using drugs. So detox without treatment just isn't going to work. Treatment, including medications as well as the counseling, works a whole lot better. So what do we hope to accomplish with treatment for opiate use disorders? Well, simply we want to suppress withdrawal. The patients that come to me um, are not so much, uh, they're coming because they're sick. They are tired of the withdrawal that they're experiencing, running and gunning and trying to find the drug that keeps them healthy. They will tell me that, you know, I don't get high from this anymore. I just want to stay healthy. We want to eliminate the craving, block the uh, euphoric effect of exogenous opioids, which means if I have something in, uh, occupying that mu receptor when I use this other opioid, I don't get high or it's a limited response. And then we want life to get better. Taking it down a notch now specifically to medication assisted treatment, we want to see reduced mortality. Um, and in this day and age of, in the 1980s, methadone treatment became much more popular because of HIV coming around. And nowadays, it's, it's hepatitis, and specifically hepatitis C. Lots of diseases associated with substance use disorders. Treatment helps that. Um, people just need to be better physically, mentally, socially, socially in having a job and making some money in their relationships with friends and family, not getting arrested. That is the essence of success. And I'll carry it one step further to say it's not that they are on or off a medication. It's that life is better. If they achieve that, I'm, I'm happy. Recognize I'm real biased, um, but they make me happy. That, that, that's a little bit. So opiate agonist treatment and the medications we use, as I said, because of the pharmacology of the medications, buprenorphine and methadone, they are non-euphoric. Um, they do relieve craving and withdrawal. A side benefit, they're analgesic. You really can get some pain relief because many of our patients come to us having started because they got that first prescription after their car accident or their fracture and it just uh, went on from there. On the other hand, we need to recognize that it does produce physiologic tolerance, both the methadone and the buprenorphine, so you can't just get on and just get off because you will go into withdrawal. It's not easy. This treatment is long term. I've talked about uh, again and again the brain disease. It doesn't get, it gets better some, but it doesn't get better fast. So patients are looking at long term treatment. Specific to methadone, daily clinic dosing. That means you can't go and do what you want when you want it. You need to earn privileges. Uh, you need to be stable in treatment. Most of our patients come misusing multiple substances. Methadone, buprenorphine only treat the opioid use disorder. They do not address the stimulant use, the benzodiazepine use, the alcohol, which is quite common, the marijuana use. Um, it does require counseling, and some people just don't tolerate the medication. They just don't do well with it. So we have to look for alternatives. So, the alter so it's still important when a patient presents to me that I give them their options. We can't dismiss the fact that perhaps an abstinence-based program, no medication, just the counseling can work. And there are certain populations that would benefit from that. Talk about a younger population, talk about somebody that's fairly naive to treatment, hasn't experienced anything. But again, I'm biased. And if somebody comes to me with an active opioid use disorder, meets DSM-5 criteria, having some crises in their life, I'm probably going to offer them medication as long as they understand what they're getting themselves into, long-term treatment. So the medications, uh, methadone, 
naltrexone, oral, and injectable is the Vivitrol. Remember, that's the, pure, that's the antagonist, and buprenorphine. Abstinence remains an option. I'll show you that slide in a bit. Methadone. Well, not everybody can do methadone. Got to be there every day. Have to be able to afford the fees. Got to be willing to see the counselor. Uh, Got to have access to the clinic. Not so bad here in the Louisville area. We have three clinics that offer services in a, in a, you know, a limited area. But you go out to eastern Kentucky and patients are traveling an hour plus each way to be able to get back and forth to the clinic on a daily basis. Not, not very workable for most. Fortunately, the price of gas is a little bit lower now, and, and it's a bit more affordable, but those financial implications are, are very strong. Um, buprenorphine treatment, a real benefit. Still, regulation and standards of care that require patients to be really involved in, in treatment. But it is an office-based setting. They don't need to come to the clinic. They don't necessarily need to be seen every day. Typically, they're seen at least at the outset on a weekly basis, and that can get expanded. But a lot of that depends on how well they're doing in treatment. It's a good medication, long-acting medication, once a day dosing, making it simple to take, um, and fairly well tolerated. And if you look at the scientific evidence and all of those measures of success, well proven, it does quite well. Which patients? Um, costly medication. Insurance has even a higher barrier to coverage, but I have to admit Medicaid is coming around to being able to pay for it. Uh, the commercial insurers do, do pretty well with it. Um, and, still, and then it requires access to treatment, uh, need to be able to find a physician, and, and you know, we're a little bit limited really nationally. Uh, there aren't that many doctors that really like doing this, and some of them charge a high fee and don't take insurance. Now, Trexone slash Vivitrol can serve the purpose. I've alluded to the fact that it's an antagonist and therefore doesn't give very much effect, um, any kind of reward or opiate response, and so patients may not like it that much. It does require that the patient has been completely off opiates for at least a week, if not a couple of weeks, before they take their first dose. It's an expensive medication. It typically works for that population who is very highly motivated, has a very strong support system. It was, uh, I, I saw a lot of it used in impaired physicians, impaired professionals program because licenses were at stake and so there was a real buy-in to using a medication like that. And then, the, you know, the general public, and we're seeing much more in even the clinical public as well now, looking at Vivitrol and Naltrexone as a much, as a compromise for medication-assisted treatment. Um, a lot of you know, money is being made available fe uh, federally and statewide for treatment of substance use disorders. Um, there is a mandate if you're going to get those monies that you need to provide medication assisted treatment. Still are a lot of those programs that don't want to look at buprenorphine and methadone, but Vivitrol and Naltrexone would be an acceptable alternative. Personal opinion, I don't think it works as well but I haven't had as much experience with that as I have with the other products. I think I've talked about all of that. The injectable um, Vivitrol, you know, we're always concerned about diversion. These medications get out on the street, and that's a whole other topic. By using an injectable form, obviously diversion is not going to occur. Um, on the other hand, it's on board, and you can't take it away if you need to for some reason. If it's occupying that mu receptor and somebody does have their tooth out or break their leg or have surgery, to get proper pain control, you may be a bit limited because that naltrexone is there, and it binds very tightly to that receptor. So this is what I was talking about in terms of, gee, what kind of treatment works best. This is looking at specifically buprenorphine, but it's very similar to methadone, that you put patients in, you maybe have them in the hospital two, three, four days, get detoxed, and send them home and basically an abstinence-based program, they fall out of treatment really quickly and relapse. 
On the other hand, when you look at medication-assisted treatment, uh, get stabilized on the medication, they stay in treatment for long periods of time, which gives you access to them, gets them the counseling, gives them the ability to make the changes in their life that are necessary to, to be successful. Methadone in Kentucky. I'm going to summarize some of these, the, the next three, four, five slides. I'll, I'll talk first and then we'll go through the slides. Um, federal, you know, methadone clinics exist under the auspices of federal guidelines. That, as, as I said, really, the newer guidelines are from the mid 60s. They've been updated some and the, it's the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration that oversees it. So we as a clinic are responsible to SAMHSA. We're responsible to the DEA in terms of uh, taking charge of the medication, but we're also responsible to the state. So the, the federal guidelines are fairly flexible, um, but states can do at a minimum that and make things a bit, if you will, more difficult or stricter in terms of how to manage your program. For, for good or bad, Kentucky tends to be fairly strict. And I say that just to sort of make you, the public, if you will, comfortable with the fact that when we offer methadone treatment, it's done well. One, because I think we have good clinicians, and two, because the state mandates that we do it well. It's just not dose and go. You're just not going there for medication. So we have, you know, daily dosing. They are to seek counsel, and this is at the outset of treatment, on the, at the onset of treatment, um, as they do well, they gain privileges. And ultimately, although it takes three, four years, patients could be coming to the clinic once every four weeks, see their counselor, give us a drug screen, pick up their medications to administer to themselves at home. But we need to trust that. And it, it, we all feel it takes a little bit of while to do that. Uh, weekly observed and random drug screens. Um, we don't exist alone. It's just not me and it's just not the counselors and nursing staff. We use a lot of outside resources because these patients come with comorbid diseases, psychiatric diseases, medical problems, uh, social problems that need a variety of, of services. And so we have to coordinate our care. The hospitals, including obstetrics, has become a very big issue with prescription opioid use, we started to see a demographic that changed to a, a much younger demographic. So we start, and, and actually we saw more men than women, now it's probably even men and women. It used to be 30 plus 40 year olds, and now it's a lot of 20 year olds, and unfortunately, fertile 20 year old women get pregnant, and we see a lot of pregnancy. And um, it's a difficult problem to take care of, both from an addiction treatment standpoint as well as an obstetrical standpoint. And, and we've got some very, not, very good physicians who we work with uh, throughout the community. Um, big CPS, highly involved. We did, we've done a lot of work at the clinic creating these liaisons, educating CPS, probation, parole, the, the OBs. And I think we've done a good job, and they're pretty much on board now and work very cooperatively with us. By regulation, we have to have these cooperative agreements with uh, community resources. Um, I mentioned this oversight. The SNA is the State Narcotic Authority. The program sponsor, I don't know if you, any, if you know Carrie Kaplan, who, who is our program sponsor, and he may have some things to say if he, he wishes, but the credentialing of all the staff that we have, Kentucky takes it very seriously. So it's a master's degree. It's experience, two years minimum experience in addiction treatment. This, the substance abuse counselors have to have a, a college degree. They have to have their CADC certification, the nurses, LPNs or RNs. It, it goes on and on. The staff is a well-qualified staff. Um, these are all the different services that we will offer to the patients. Obviously, first step is to get them drug free, get the brains working a little bit better, and then get, get them engaged in, in community resources because they need all of this. In order to be admitted, 
this, this probably you don't need to know, but they need to have an exam. Uh, you know, we're taking care of them physically, emotionally, socially, and spiritually, and these are all the associations that we have and the engagements and treatment that we create for them. I've commented on the credentialing. Uh, I didn't mention medical director. It just can't be a doctor. It has to be a doctor with an addiction specialty in psychiatry, in um, general medicine, or in uh, osteopathy. Um, these are just one of the things that we struggle with a little bit is we're in Kentucky, there's the Ohio River, and there's Indiana. And Indiana has a whole different set of regulations. And if you're really interested, you can find them and read them and compare Kentucky and Indiana, but it will support that a lot stricter here in Kentucky. Uh, how to get admitted. Privileges. The eight-point criteria talk about those guidelines that need to be used that you, yes, you are a stable patient. You can manage these take-homes, this medication at home. We can trust you. Um, drug screens very regularly. And then buprenorphine standards. Um, there are some standards. It's actually not law regulation. It's just guy, uh, you know, standards of care by the Kentucky Board of Medical Licensure. A lot more is left up to the individual physician practitioner to decide how often the patient's to be seen, how often they should be going to counseling, how often to get drug screens. Um, Kentucky, again, with their standards, said, you know, in those first two, three months, we're going to require that a lot of all of those things be done. It's not, and, and I would say that from the American Society of Addiction Medicine, we actually came out with our standards before they came out with their standards, but they're pretty even uh, as far as what the expectations are. Everybody from doctor on needs CME. We use CASPER reports, that's the prescription drug monitoring program. Um, uh, looking, and I, and I always like to say this, and you know, if, if you look at a CASPER report from a patient coming into treatment, oftentimes you'll see multiple prescriptions. It's just great when we repeat CASPER's three months, six months, a year down the line. They haven't gone to the doctor, they haven't gone to the hospital. Things are good, they're not over-utilizing medical resources. Um, the whole community wins out with this treatment. Uh, with buprenorphine, there are certain indications for consultations, for obstetrical care uh, in pregnancy, um, for psychiatric care with comorbid psychiatric problems. So to end, good treatment is holistic, integrated, multifaceted, taking into account the physical, behavioral, spiritual needs to treat this biological, psychological, social disease. Medication is great, needs to be used in combination with behavioral treatment. Not everybody needs medication, but I think we need to be more open to its use, particularly with the growth and all uh, of this disease and um, that untreated population out there. So I am open to questions. Carrie, anything to say? Yes how the way addiction is treated has evolved in Louisville. I mean, there was a time when you were the only game in town in terms of medicine. You know, it's funny, I, always, I would like to say that, well, Louisville has always been old in its thinking, but when I go to, you know, and speak with physicians around nationally, everybody's saying, gee, there's just this old thinking, and that is some of the stigma and the acceptance of medication. Louisville comes from an abstinence-based model, um, and, and that is, however strict that abstinence is with no medications, it really is a 12-step philosophy, uh, counseling, but no use of medications. Now, we're fortunate that for opiate use disorders, there are great medications out there. For alcohol, there are some good medications. For tobacco, there are some good medications. But unfortunately, for the stimulants and the benzos and, and uh, 
marijuana, there aren't medications. So that kind of abstinence-based practice is all we have to use. That has existed for a long, long time. I see it coming around now. I can hypothesize, I suggested that, well, monies are available, and we want to keep our programs going, and we need to use medication-assisted treatment. That being said, all of those other treatment centers from seven counties to including JDAC to the healing place have come around talking to us, Louisville Metro Corrections. We're seeing all these people and some of them just aren't doing very well. So there's a lot more talk about having that toolbox, opening it up and looking at what are all of our resources, including medications to treat. But it is old school and there's still a significant number of people that think that way. The, the disease process and the understanding of the disease process and understanding this biologic nature and having scientific evidence showing here is the, here are the cellular changes, we've measured this. It, you know, bothers me. In diabetes, we know that there are organs that aren't working well. And here's medication, common analogy that I use. And we'll tell that patient, good diet, good exercise, the counseling, the behavior changes, and see them back in three months, six months, a year, and hope that they're under control and can be off medication. But some people don't participate the behavioral changes or do, aren't completely successful, still need medication. And I think this brain disease needs to be approached the same way. And a second question, explain in a simple way what Narcan is supposed to do. What Narcan is supposed to Narcan, talk about naltrexone, a full antagonist. Narcan is exactly the same, a full antagonist. Opioid binds to that mu receptor, actually gets there real fast, particularly when you're using it nasally or by injection. It binds very tightly, so anything else that's attached to that opioid receptor, the heroin, can get kicked off. Um, so the overdose, the opioid effects, the sedation, the respiratory depression leading to that overdose and, and emergent care goes away. Um, problem is very short acting. So five minutes, 10 minutes down the line that opioids or the other heroin is still circulating in there. Best be aware that uh, of, uh, and available a second, a second injection, but it is that antagonist and they go into, and they go into withdrawal. I mean, there were programs that, were, and there probably still are some around, that they used to call rapid detox. They put patients addicted to opiates and they just put them under uh, anesthesia so they don't feel anything and give them Narcan or Naltrexone to get them through the withdrawal real fast and then get them into other treatment. And, but when you hear about abusing it on the street, the goal is to reverse the breathing problems, correct? Yes. That is the primary purpose, specifically for that. Yeah, it's too short acting to be used in a maintenance kind of program. Well, how, how successful is the methadone with dual diagnosis patients? That's a hard one for me to answer. With specifically, you know, everybody is dual diagnosis. If you look at the science and, and, and look at, I, I will find studies that will show from as low as 30% dual diagnosis, depending on how you um, define it, to 80% dual diagnosis. A lot of anxiety, a lot of uh, depression, some um, attention deficit disorder, and much more significant psychiatric problems. It's definitely a much more difficult process to treat. Um, we have patients, you know, most of our patients are presenting that way with dual diagnoses. Um, usually they're not in crisis from a psychiatric standpoint, therefore we can treat the addiction and a lot of that will melt away. And you like to be able to, you know, I, I tell them you can't, you know, you're not, you're doing your psychiatrist a disservice by asking them to treat you for your, for example, PTSD while you're actively using drugs. It's, it's, it's much more difficult to do. Let's get the addiction under control. On, on the other hand, sometimes they're just doing poorly on, in the addiction treatment and they need some more immediate psychiatric care in order to be able to engage in the addiction treatment. Um, you know, the, the success, if, if you look at detox abstinence-based programs, well, no, let me take that back. You look at people in methadone treatment who leave maintenance treatment, you probably have a 90% relapse rate. It, it is just that 
high. Um, continued methadone maintenance, we're talking about you know, people being successful 70 to 80 percent with continued maintenance. Um, in the comorbid, I can't separate that out for you. But it is harder, so it would be less. Yes, sir? Do you have an idea about how, how many psychiatric disorders might be cleared up just through just through a recovery program, and it's a product of the chemical itself rather than something that's a diagnosable, diagnosable psychiatric disorder, regardless of the chemicals or not. Yeah, I can't say how how many patients present, and I say, of course you're depressed. I don't have any patient actively using drugs that presents to me that that isn't depressed. Um, so the, the cycle of their continued substance use leads to other psychiatric disorders and, and a lot will go away. Turning that around, how do you treat psychiatric disorders? Well, really the same way we treat you know, substance use disorders, a combination of counseling and medications. And some people don't need medications and some people do. They all need counseling. Um, so it's, it's putting all of that together. A lot will go away with treatment of their substance use disorder so that they don't need medications for psychiatric disorders, but they all need counsel continued counseling. So what would your take home message be for parents or young adults in terms of preventing this whole thing? Like about, what about emptying the medicine cabinet of your pain meds and that kind of thing? I, I think you know parents, adults need to understand the dangers of these medications and uh, and of any medication. Um, we see childhood exposures of this stuff leading to overdose and death, and, and that's one of the problems that that uh, developed early on with buprenorphine, and therefore a change in the formulations. Um, there's a slide that I have that talks about first exposure to an opiate and better than 50 percent of that first exposure comes from family friend relative and typically that is it's just hanging around so all of us need to be careful about taking care of the medication you finish your prescription you get rid of it in a in a, in a proper manner um, second piece of that was uh, that that okay and then a related question so you, everybody hears about, you know, somebody's got a kid or a brother or whatever, and they go to, to treatment for 30 days, and they come back, and two or three months later, they're in trouble. Why? <laughs> Why are they in trouble again? Um, the other piece of this is, you know, what can you do for your kids? You know, this is also a genetic disease. So if you have family history of this, you just need to, and then in general, you need to be open with the young population. And we're really talking starting at eight, nine, 10 years old, that drugs are out there. You are going to get exposed. Here is your risk based on, but anybody is at risk. If you use the substance long enough, even if you don't have that genetic history, you will develop the brain changes that can lead to addictive behaviors. Um, but this also is a family disease. And just treating, you know, when we're treating the identified patient, uh, we tell them, you know, the first thing you really need to do is have a very safe, healthy, clean environment. You can't be around, whether it be family members, friends, whatever, the drugs. So they need to get rid of the stash at home. They can't be hanging out with. And then you see the family members have what, what are called, you know, codependent enabling kinds of behavior. So as a family disease, it's really nice to be, get, to be able to get the family to better understand their role, get their education about the process. Too many patients come and say, you know, my husband's just really bothered how much this is costing me every week, every month, and wants me to get off the methadone or seize the methadone as a drug and, and the crutch. The family members, the support system in general needs to understand what this is all about. Education, education, education for everybody. Uh, you know, it's important for you to identify the extent or the seriousness of the problem. If it's emergent, you get help right away. On the other hand, if you feel, well, you know, obviously those kinds of things have been happening for 
an extended period of time. I think about when I have a patient present to me, and at the methadone clinic, they come to me and they want treatment. They've made the decision. They're there. They want to do it. But in an office setting, you're sometimes getting patients who are still questioning. And so I can't say, like the surgeon, we're taking your gallbladder out tomorrow. You need to take it out. I, all I want out of that first visit is I want you to be able to come back and talk to me. And so to be able to engage that person, because you'll get a whole lot more information the second visit, the third visit, but ultimately you have to act. Um, you know, when I, I used to say, tell patients, and I still get patients, both for buprenorphine and, and methadone coming in, asking me when, about when they're going to get off the medication before they even started. I used to talk to patients and say, you know, two years. It, it really just does take that long. I've de I really have extended that to three years. Um, I think it takes that long for healing of the brain, but also to really get your ducks in a row, uh, you know, in your social situation and develop that kind of support system. That being said, I strongly, strongly believe in this damaged brain. And although we can do other things, and I push this a fair amount, to help improve the brain function over and beyond the medication. So we think about things like yoga, meditation, relaxation, acupuncture, those complementary medi medical techniques. I think that they all somehow work through the reward system as well, the natural endorphins. People need to get engaged in those kinds of things to, to be able to be successful in getting off and staying um, healthy in a healthy recovery. But three, three years minimum. With my buprenorphine folks, you know, I, I tell this story a lot too. When it, it first came out in 2002, the patients came out of the woodwork um, because they were ones that just didn't want to go to the methadone clinic. They too believed in this stigma. And I saw a much, and, and the study supported that too, a much higher functioning, uh, um, higher educated, higher socioeconomic group of people that just were seeking treatment. And they were, I want this medication, I want to get better, and they were ones who didn't want to be on it that long. But they, start, they forgot to ask me. They stopped asking me about getting off the medication. Life was so good, this is okay going to the doctor once a month and getting my medication because it's great. And there's a real fear part of that too about coming off. I think that that leads to a lot of relapse, but it takes a long time. Okay, well, I appreciate you all being here. I hope I was helpful. And uh, I'm at the Moore Center if you need anything.